People looked at each other, and then at us on the platform, to see whence came this interruption, not set down in the bills. Firmly and irrepressibly, the quavering voices sang on, verse after verse. Others of the colored people joined in. Some whites on the platform began, but I motioned them to silence. I never saw anything so electric. It made all other words cheap. It seemed the choked voice of a race at last unloosed. Nothing could be more wonderfully unconscious. Art could not have dreamed of a tribute to the day of jubilee that should be so affecting. History will not believe it, and when I came to speak of it, after it was ended, tears were everywhere. If you could have heard how quaint and innocent it was, old Tiff and his children might have sung it, and close before me was a little slave boy, almost white, who seemed to belong to the party, and even he must join in. Just think of it, the first day they had ever had a country, the first flag they had ever seen which promised anything to their people. And here, while mere spectators stood in silence, waiting for my stupid words, these simple souls burst out in their lay, as if they were by their own hearths at home. When they stopped, there was nothing to do for it but to speak, and I went on. But the life of the whole day was in those unknown people's songs. Receiving the flags, I gave them into the hands of two fine-looking men, jet black, as color guard, and they also spoke, and very effectively, Sergeant Prince Rivers and Corporal Robert Sutton. The regiment sang Marching Along, and then General Saxton spoke in his own simple, manly way, and Mrs. Francis D. Gage spoke very sensibly to the women, and Judge Stickney from Florida added something. Then some gentlemen sang an ode, and the regiment the John Brown song, and then they went to their beef and molasses. Everything was very orderly, and they seemed to have a very gay time. Most of the visitors had far to go, and so dispersed before dress parade, though the band stayed to enliven it. In the evening, we had letters from home, and General Saxton had a reception at his house, from which I excused myself, and so ended one of the most enthusiastic and happy gatherings I ever knew. The day was perfect, and there was nothing but success. I forgot to say that, in the midst of the services, it was announced that General Fremont was appointed Commander-in-Chief, an announcement which was received with immense cheering, as would have been almost anything else, I verily believe, at that moment of high tide. It was shouted across by the pickets above, a way in which we often receive news, but not always trustworthy. January the 3rd, 1863. Once and once only, thus far, the water has frozen in my tent, and the next morning showed a dense white frost outside. We have still mockingbirds and crickets and rosebuds, and occasional noonday baths in the river though the butterflies have vanished, as I remember to have observed in file after December. I have been here nearly six weeks without a rainy day. One or two slight showers there have been, once interrupting a drill, but never dress parade. For climate, by day, we might be among the Isles of Greece, though it may be my constant familiarity with the names of her sages, which suggests that impression. For instance, a voice just now called, near my tent, Cato, Wars Plato. The men have somehow got the impression that it is essential to the validity of a marriage that they should come to me for permission, just as they used to go to the master. And I rather encourage these little confidences because it is so entertaining to hear them. Now, Cunnel, said a faltering swain the other day, I want forget me one good lady, which I approved especially the limitation as to number. Afterwards, I asked one of the bridegroom's friends whether he thought it a good match. Oh, yes, Cunnel, said he, in all the cordiality of friendship, John's Gwine for Mary Venus. I trust the goddess will prove herself a better lady than she appeared during her previous career upon this planet. But this naturally suggests the Isles of Greece again. January 7th. On first arriving, 
I found a good deal of anxiety among the officers as to the increase of desertions, that being the rock on which the hunter regiment split. Now this evil is very nearly stopped, and we are every day recovering the older absentees. One of the very best things that have happened to us was the half-accidental shooting of a man who had escaped from the guardhouse and was wounded by a squad sent in pursuit. He has since died, and this very evening another man, who escaped with him, came and opened the door of my tent, after being five days in the woods almost without food. His clothes were in rags, and he was nearly starved, poor foolish fellow, so that we can almost dispense with further punishment. Severe penalties would be wasted on these people, accustomed as they have been to the most violent passions on the part of white men, but a mild inexorableness tells on them, just as it does on any other children. It is something utterly new to them, and it is thus far perfectly efficacious. They have a great deal of pride as soldiers, and a very little of severity goes a great way, if it be firm and consistent. This is very encouraging. The single question which I asked of some of the plantation superintendents on the voyage was, do these people appreciate justice? If they did, it was evident that all the rest would be easy. When a race is degraded beyond that point, it must be very hard to deal with them. They must mistake all kindness for indulgence, all strictness for cruelty. With these freed slaves, there is no such trouble not a particle. Let an officer be only just and firm, with a cordial, kindly nature, and he has no sort of difficulty. The plantation superintendents and teachers have the same experience, they say, but we have an immense advantage in the military organization, which helps in two ways. It increases their self-respect, and it gives us an admirable machinery for discipline, thus improving both the fulcrum and the lever. The wounded man died in the hospital, and the general verdict seemed to be, him brought it on himself. Another soldier died of pneumonia on the same day, and we had the funerals in the evening. It was very impressive. A dense mist came up, with a moon behind it, and we had only the light of pine splinters, as the procession wound along beneath the mighty, moss-hung branches of the ancient grove. The groups around the grave, the dark faces, the red garments, the scattered lights, the misty boughs, were weird and strange. The men sang one of their own wild chants. Two crickets sang also, one on either side, and did not cease their little monotone, even when the three volleys were fired above the graves. Just before the coffins were lowered, an old man whispered to me that I must have their position altered, the heads must be towards the west, so it was done, though they are in a place so veiled in woods that either rising or setting sun will find it hard to spy them. We have now a good regimental hospital, admirably arranged in a deserted gin house, a fine well of our own digging, within the camp lines, a full allowance of tents, all floored, a wooden cookhouse to every company, with sometimes a palmetto mess house beside a substantial wooden guardhouse with a fireplace five feet in de clar, where the men off duty can dry themselves and sleep comfortably in bunks afterwards. We have also a great circular school tent made of condemned canvas 30 feet in diameter and looking like some of the Indian lodges I saw in Kansas. We now meditate a regimental bakery. Our aggregate has increased from 490 to 740, besides a hundred recruits now waiting at St. Augustine, and we have practiced through all the main movements in battalion drill. Affairs being thus prosperous, and yesterday having been six weeks since my last and only visit to Beaufort, I rode in, glanced at several camps, and dined with the general. It seemed absolutely like re-entering the world, and I did not fully estimate my past seclusion till it occurred to me, as a strange and novel phenomenon, that the soldiers at the other camps were white. January 8th This morning I went to Beaufort again, 
on necessary business and by good luck happened upon a review and drill of the white regiments. The thing that struck me most was that same absence of uniformity in minor points that I noticed at first in my own officers. The best regiments in the department are represented among my captains and lieutenants, and very well represented too, yet it has cost much labor to bring them to any uniformity in their drill. There is no need of this, for the prescribed tactics, approach, perfection. It is never left discretionary in what place an officer shall stand or in what words he shall give his order. All variation would seem to imply negligence. Yet even West Point occasionally varies from the tactics, as, for instance, in requiring the line officers to face down the line when each is giving the order to his company. In our strictest Massachusetts regiments, this is not done. It needs an artist's eye to make a perfect drill master. Yet the small points are not merely a matter of punctilio, for the more perfectly a battalion is drilled on the parade ground, the more quietly it can be handled in action. Moreover, the great need of uniformity is this, that, in the field, soldiers of different companies, and even of different regiments, are liable to be intermingled, and a diversity of orders may throw everything into confusion. Confusion means bull run. I wished my men at the review today, for amidst all the rattling and noise of artillery and the galloping of cavalry, there was only one infantry movement that we have not practiced, and that was done by only one regiment, and apparently considered quite a novelty, though it is easily taught, forming square by Casey's method, forward on center. It is really just as easy to drill a regiment as a company, perhaps easier, because one has more time to think, but it is just as essential to be sharp and decisive, perfectly clear-headed, and to put life into the men. A regiment seems small when one has learned how to handle it, a mere handful of men, and I have no doubt that a brigade or a division would soon appear equally small. But to handle either judiciously, ah, that is another affair, so of governing. It is as easy to govern a regiment as a school or a factory, and needs like qualities, system, promptness, patience, tact. Moreover, in a regiment, one has the aid of the admirable machinery of the army, so that I see very ordinary men who succeed very tolerably. Reports of a six-month's armistice are rife here, and the thought is deplored by all. I cannot believe it, yet sometimes one feels very anxious about the ultimate fate of these poor people. After the experience of Hungary, one sees that revolutions may go backward and the habit of injustice seems so deeply impressed upon the whites that it is hard to believe in the possibility of anything better. I dare not yet hope that the promise of the President's proclamation will be kept. For myself, I can be indifferent, for the experience here has been its own daily and hourly reward, and the adaptedness of the freed slaves for drill and discipline is now thoroughly demonstrated and must soon be universally acknowledged. But it would be terrible to see this regiment disbanded or defrauded. January 12th. Many things glide by without time to narrate them. On Saturday, we had a mail with the President's second message of emancipation, and the next day it was read to the men. The words themselves did not stir them very much because they have been often told that they were free, especially on New Year's Day and, being unversed in politics, they do not understand, as well as we do, the importance of each additional guarantee. But the chaplain spoke to them afterwards very effectively, as usual, and then I proposed to them to hold up their hands and pledge themselves to be faithful to those still in bondage. They entered heartily into this, and the scene was quite impressive, beneath the great oak branches. I heard afterwards that only one man refused to raise his hand, saying bluntly that his wife was out of slavery with him, and he did not care to fight. The other soldiers of his company were very indignant and shoved him about among them while marching back to their quarters, calling him a coward. I was glad of their exhibition of feeling, though it is very possible 
that the one who had thus the moral courage to stand alone among his comrades might be more reliable, on a pinch, than some who yielded a more ready assent. But the whole response on their part was very hearty and will be a good thing to which to hold them hereafter, at any time of discouragement or demoralization, which was my chief reason for proposing it. With their simple natures, it is a great thing to tie them to some definite committal. They never forget a marked occurrence and never seem disposed to evade a pledge. It is this capacity of honor and fidelity which gives me such entire faith in them as soldiers. Without it, all their religious demonstration would be mere sentimentality. For instance, everyone who visits the camp is struck with their bearing as sentinels. They exhibit, in this capacity, not an upstart conceit, but a steady, conscientious devotion to duty. They would stop their idolized General Saxton if he attempted to cross their beat contrary to orders. I have seen them. No feeble or incompetent race could do this. The officers tell many amusing instances of this fidelity, but I think mine the best. It was very dark the other night, an unusual thing here, and the rain fell in torrents, so I put on my India rubber suit and went the rounds of the sentinels incognito to test them. I can only say that I shall never try such an experiment again and have cautioned my officers against it. Tis a wonder I escaped with life and limb, such a charging of bayonets and clicking of gun locks. Sometimes I tempted them by refusing to give any countersign, but offering them a piece of tobacco, which they could not accept without allowing me nearer than the prescribed bayonet's distance. Tobacco is more than gold to them, and it was touching to watch the struggle in their minds. But they always did their duty at last, and I never could persuade them. One man, as if wishing to crush all his inward vacillations at one fell stroke, told me stoutly that he never used tobacco, though I found the next day that he loved it as much as any one of them. It seemed wrong thus to tamper with their fidelity, yet it was a vital matter to me to know how far it could be trusted out of my sight. It was so intensely dark that not more than one or two knew me, even after I had talked with the very next sentinel, especially as they had never seen me in India rubber clothing, and I can always disguise my voice. It was easy to distinguish those who did make the discovery. They were always conscious and simpering when their turn came, while the others were stout and irreverent till I revealed myself, and then rather coed and anxious, fearing to have offended. It rained harder and harder, and when I had nearly made the rounds, I had had enough of it, and, simply giving the countersign to the challenging sentinel, undertook to pass within the lines. Halt! exclaimed this dusky man and brother, bringing down his bayonet. The countersign's not correct. Now the magic word in this case was Vicksburg, in honor of a rumored victory. But as I knew that these hard names became quite transformed upon their lips, Carthage being familiarized into cartridge and Concord into corncob, how could I possibly tell what shade of pronunciation my friend might prefer for this particular proper name? Vicksburg, I repeated, blandly but authoritatively, endeavoring, as zealously as one of Christie's minstrels, to assimilate my speech to any supposed predilection of the Ethiop vocal organs. Halt there! Countersign's not correct! was the only answer. The bayonet still maintained a position which, in a military point of view, was impressive. I tried persuasion, orthography, threats, tobacco, all in vain. I could not pass in. Of course my pride was up, for was I to defer to an untutored African on a point of pronunciation? Classic shades of Harvard forbid. Affecting scornful indifference, I tried to edge away, proposing to myself to enter the camp at some other point where my elocution would be better appreciated. Not a step could I stir. Halt! shouted my gentleman again, still holding me at his bayonet's point, and I wincing and halting. I explained to him the extreme absurdity of this proceeding, called his attention to the state of the weather, which indeed spoke for itself so loudly that we could hardly hear each other speak, and requested permission to withdraw. The bayonet, with mute eloquence, 
refuse the application. There flashed into my mind, with more enjoyment in the retrospect than I had experienced at the time, an adventure on a lecturing tour in other years when I had spent an hour in trying to scramble into a country tavern after bedtime on the coldest night of winter. On that occasion, I ultimately found myself stuck midway in the window, with my head in a temperature of 80 de grad and my heels in a temperature of 10 de grad, with a heavy window sash pinioning the small of my back. However, I had got safe out of that dilemma, and it was time to put an end to this one. Call the corporal of the guard, said I at last, with dignity, unwilling either to make a knight of it or to yield my incognito. Corporal of the guard, he shouted lustily, post number two, while I could hear another sentinel chuckling with laughter. This last was a special guard, placed over a tent with a prisoner in charge. Presently, he broke silence. Who am dat? he asked in a stage whisper. Am he a buckra white man? Dunno whether he been a buckra or not responded doggedly my cerberus in uniform but i's bound to keep him here till the corporal of the guard come yet when that dignitary arrived and i revealed myself poor number two appeared utterly transfixed with terror and seemed to look for nothing less than immediate execution of course i praised his fidelity and the next day complimented him before the guard and mentioned him to his captain and the whole affair was very good for them all Hereafter, if Satan himself should approach them in darkness and storm, they will take him for the colonel and treat him with special severity. January 13th In many ways, the childish nature of this people shows itself. I have just had to make a change of officers in a company which has constantly complained, and with good reason, of neglect and improper treatment. Two excellent officers have been assigned to them, and yet they sent a deputation to me in the evening, in a state of utter wretchedness. We's very grieved this evening, Colonel. Peers like we couldn't bear it, to lose the captain and the lieutenant, all two together. Argument was useless, and I could only fall back on the general theory that I knew what was best for them, which had much more effect, and I also could cite the instance of another company, which had been much improved by a new captain, as they readily admitted. So with the promise that the new officers should not be savage to we, which was the one thing they deprecated, I assuaged their woes. Twenty-four hours have passed, and I hear them singing most merrily all down that company street. I often notice how their griefs may be dispelled, like those of children, merely by permission to utter them. If they can tell their sorrows, they go away happy, even without asking to have anything done about them. I observe also a peculiar dislike of all intermediate control. They always wish to pass by the company officer and deal with me personally for everything. General Saxton notices the same thing with the people on the plantations as regards himself. I suppose this proceeds partly from the old habit of appealing to the master against the overseer. Kind words would cost the master nothing, and he could easily put off any non-fulfillment upon the overseer. Moreover, the Negroes have acquired such constitutional distrust of white people that it is perhaps as much as they can do to trust more than one person at a time. Meanwhile, this constant personal intercourse is out of the question in a well-ordered regiment, and the remedy for it is to introduce by degrees more and more of a system, so that their immediate officers will become all-sufficient for the daily routine. It is perfectly true, as I find everybody takes for granted, that the first essential for an officer of colored troops is to gain their confidence. But it is equally true, though many persons do not appreciate it, that the admirable methods and proprieties of the regular army are equally available for all troops, and that the sublimest philanthropist, if he does not appreciate this, is unfit to command them. Another childlike attribute in these men, which is less agreeable, is a sort of blunt insensibility to giving physical pain. 
If they are cruel to animals, for instance, it always reminds me of children pulling off flies' legs in a sort of pitiless, untaught, experimental way. Yet I should not fear any wanton outrage from them. After all their wrongs, they are not really revengeful, and I would far rather enter a captured city with them than with white troops, for they would be more subordinate. But for mere physical suffering, they would have no fine sympathies. The cruel things they have seen and undergone have helped to blunt them. And if I ordered them to put to death a dozen prisoners, I think they would do it without remonstrance. Yet their religios spirit grows more beautiful to me in living longer with them. It is certainly far more so than at first when it seemed rather a matter of phrasy and habit. It influences them both on the negative and the positive side. That is, it cultivates the feminine virtues first, makes them patient, meek, resigned. This is very evident in the hospital. There is nothing of the restless, defiant habit of white invalids. Perhaps, if they had more of this, they would resist disease better. Imbued from childhood with the habit of submission, drinking in through every pore that other world trust, which is the one spirit of their songs, they can endure everything. This I expected, but I am relieved to find that their religion strengthens them on the positive side also, gives zeal, energy, daring. They could easily be made fanatics if I chose, but I do not choose. Their whole mood is essentially Mohammedan, perhaps, in its strength and its weakness and I feel the same degree of sympathy that I should if I had a Turkish command, that is, a sort of sympathetic admiration, not tending towards agreement, but towards cooperation. Their philosophizing is often the highest form of mysticism, and our dear surgeon declares that they are all natural transcendentalists. The white camps seem rough and secular after this, and I hear our men talk about a religious army, a gospel army in their prayer meetings. They are certainly evangelizing the chaplain, who was rather a heretic at the beginning. At least, this is his own admission. We have recruits on their way from St. Augustine, where the Negroes are chiefly Roman Catholics, and it will be interesting to see how their type of character combines with that elder creed. It is time for rest, and I have just looked out into the night where the eternal stars shut down in concave protection over the yet glimmering camp, and Orion hangs above my tent door, giving to me the sense of strength and assurance which these simple children obtain from their Moses and the prophets. Yet external nature does its share in their training. Witness that most poetic of all their songs, which always reminds me of the like-wake dirge in the Scottish border minstrelsy. I know moonrise, I know starrise, lay dis body down. I walk into moonlight, I walk into starlight, to lay dis body down. I'll walk into graveyard, I'll walk through the graveyard, to lay dis body down. I'll lie in the grave and stretch out my arms. Lay this body down. I go to the judgment in the evening of the day, when I lay this body down, and my soul and your soul will meet in the day. When I lay this body down. January 14th. In speaking of the military qualities of the blacks, I should add, that the only point where I am disappointed is one I have never seen raised by the most incredulous newspaper critics, namely their physical condition. To be sure, they often look magnificently to my gymnasium-trained eye, and I always like to observe them when bathing. Such splendid muscular development, set off by that smooth coating of adipose tissue which makes them, like the South Sea Islanders, appear even more muscular than they are. Their skins are also of finer grain than those of whites, the surgeons say, and certainly are smoother and far more free from hair. But their weakness is pulmonary. Pneumonia and pleurisy are their besetting ailments. They are easily made ill and easily cured if promptly treated. Childish organizations again. Guard duty injures them more than whites, apparently. 
and double-quick movements in choking dust set them coughing badly. But then it is to be remembered that this is their sickly season, from January to March, and that their healthy season will come in summer, when the whites break down. Still, my conviction of the physical superiority of more highly civilized races is strengthened on the whole, not weakened by observing them. As to availability for military drill and duty in other respects, the only question I ever hear debated among the officers is whether they are equal or superior to whites. I have never heard it suggested that they were inferior, although I expected frequently to hear such complaints from hasty or unsuccessful officers. Of one thing I am sure, that their best qualities will be wasted by merely keeping them for garrison duty. They seem peculiarly fitted for offensive operations and especially for partisan warfare. They have so much dash and such abundant resources, combined with such an Indian-like knowledge of the country and its ways. These traits have been often illustrated in expeditions sent after deserters. For instance, I dispatched one of my best lieutenants and my best sergeant with a squad of men to search a certain plantation, where there were two separate Negro villages. They went by night, and the force was divided. The lieutenant took one set of huts, the sergeant the other. Before the lieutenant had reached his first house, every man in the village was in the woods, innocent and guilty alike. But the sergeant's mode of operation was thus described by a corporal from a white regiment who happened to be in one of the Negro houses. He said that not a sound was heard until suddenly a red leg appeared in the open doorway and a voice outside said, Rally! Going to the door, he observed a similar pair of red legs before every hut, and not a person was allowed to go out until the quarters had been thoroughly searched and the three deserters found. This was managed by Sergeant Prince Rivers, our color sergeant, who is provost sergeant also, and has entire charge of the prisoners and of the daily policing of the camp. He is a man of distinguished appearance, and in old times was the crack coachman of Beaufort, in which capacity he once drove Beauregard from this plantation to Charleston, I believe. They tell me that he was once allowed to present a petition to the governor of South Carolina on behalf of slaves for the redress of certain grievances, and that a placard offering $2,000 for his recapture is still to be seen by the wayside between here and Charleston. He was a sergeant in the old Hunter Regiment and was taken by General Hunter to New York last spring where the chevrons on his arm brought a mob upon him in Broadway, whom he kept off till the police interfered. There is not a white officer in this regiment who has more administrative ability or more absolute authority over the men. They do not love him, but his mere presence has controlling power over them. He writes well enough to prepare for me a daily report of his duties in the camp. If his education reached a higher point, I see no reason why he should not command the Army of the Potomac. He is jet black, or rather, I should say, wine black. His complexion, like that of others of my darkest men, having a sort of rich, clear depth, without a trace of sootiness, and to my eye, very handsome. His features are tolerably regular and full of command, and his figure superior to that of any of our white officers being six feet high, perfectly proportioned, and of apparently inexhaustible strength and activity. His gait is like a panther's. I never saw such a tread. No anti-slavery novel has described a man of such marked ability. He makes Toussaint perfectly intelligible, and if there should ever be a black monarchy in South Carolina, he will be its king. January 15th. This morning is like May. Yesterday I saw bluebirds and a butterfly, so this winter of a fortnight is over. I fancy there is a trifle less coughing in the camp. We hear of other stations in the department where the mortality, chiefly from yellow fever, has been frightful. Doctor is rubbing his hands professionally over the fearful tales of the surgeon of a New York regiment, just from Key West, who has had 200 cases of the fever. I suppose he is a skillful, highly educated man, said I. Yes, he responded with enthusiasm. Why, he had seventy deaths. 
as if that proved his superiority past question. January 19th And first, sitting proud as a king on his throne, at the head of them all rode Sir Eichard Tyrone. But I fancy that Sir Richard felt not much better satisfied with his following than I today. J.R.L. said once that nothing was quite so good as turtle soup except mock turtle. And I have heard officers declare that nothing was so stirring as real war except some exciting parade. Today, for the first time, I marched the whole regiment through Beaufort and back the first appearance of such a novelty on any stage. They did march splendidly, this all admit. M's prediction was fulfilled. Will not be in bliss, a thousand men, everyone as black as a coal. I confess it. To look back on twenty broad double ranks of men, for they marched by platoons every polished musket having a black face beside it, and every face set steadily to the front, a regiment of freed slaves marching on into the future. It was something to remember. And when they returned through the same streets, marching by the flank with guns at a support, and each man covering his file leader handsomely, the effect on the eye was almost as fine. The band of the 8th Maine joined us at the entrance of the town and escorted us in, Sergeant Rivers said ecstatically afterwards in describing the affair. And when dat band wheel in before us and march on, my God, I quit this world altogether. I wonder if he pictured to himself the many dusky regiments, now unformed, which I seem to see marching up behind us, gathering shape out of the dim air. I had cautioned the men, before leaving camp, not to be staring about them as they marched, but to look straight to the front, every man. And they did it with their accustomed fidelity, aided by the sort of spontaneous eye for effect which is in all their melodramatic natures. One of them was heard to say exultingly afterwards, We didn't look to the right nor to the left. I didn't see Noten in Beaufort. Every step was worth a half a dollar and they all marched as if it were so. They knew well that they were marching through throngs of officers and soldiers who had drilled as many months as we had drilled weeks, and whose eyes would readily spy out every defect. And I must say that, on the whole, with a few trivial exceptions, those spectators behaved in a manly and courteous manner, and I do not care to write down all the handsome things that were said. Whether said or not, they were deserved, and there is no danger that our men will not take sufficient satisfaction in their good appearance. I was especially amused at one of our recruits, who did not march in the ranks, and who said, after watching the astonishment of some white soldiers, De Bucra soldiers look like a man who been a steal a sheep, that is, I suppose, sheepish. After passing and repassing through the town, we marched to the parade ground and went through an hour's drill, forming squares and reducing them, and doing other things which look hard on paper and are perfectly easy, in fact, and we were to have been reviewed by General Saxton, but he had been unexpectedly called to Ladies Island and did not see us at all, which was the only thing to mar the men's enjoyment. Then we marched back to camp, three miles, the men singing the John Brown song, and all manner of things as happy creatures as one can well conceive. It is worth mentioning before I close that we have just received an article about Negro troops from the London Spectator, which is so admirably true to our experience that it seems as if written by one of us. I am confident that there never has been, in any American newspaper, a treatment of the subject so discriminating and so wise. January 21st. Today brought a visit from Major General Hunter and his staff. By General Saxton's invitation, the former having just arrived in the department. I expected them at dress parade, but they came during battalion drill, rather to my dismay, and we were caught in our old clothes. It was our first review, and I dare say we did tolerably. But of course it seemed to me that the men never appeared so ill before just as one always thinks a party at one's own house a failure, even if the guests seem to enjoy it, 
because one is so keenly sensitive to every little thing that goes wrong. After review and drill, General Hunter made the men a little speech, at my request, and told them that he wished there were 50,000 of them. General Saxton spoke to them afterwards and said that 50,000 muskets were on their way for colored troops. The men cheered both the generals lustily, and they were complimentary afterwards, though I knew that the regiment could not have appeared nearly so well as on its visit to Beaufort. I suppose I felt like some anxious mamma whose children have accidentally appeared at dancing school in their old clothes. I how black I be. Forty pounds will marry me, quoth Mother Goose. Forty rounds will marry us to the American army, past divorcing, if we can only use them well. Our success or failure may make or mar the prospects of colored troops. But it is well to remember in advance that military success is really less satisfactory than any other because it may depend on a moment's turn of events, and that may be determined by some trivial thing, neither to be anticipated nor controlled. Napoleon ought to have won at Waterloo by all reasonable calculations, but who cares? All that one can expect is to do one's best and to take with equanimity the fortune of war. Next chapter, Up the St. Mary's. If Sergeant Rivers was a natural king among my dusky soldiers, Corporal Robert Sutton was the natural prime minister. If not in all respects the ablest, he was the wisest man in our ranks. As large, as powerful, and as black as our good-looking color sergeant, but more heavily built and with less personal beauty, he had a more massive brain and a far more meditative and systematic intellect. Not yet grounded, even in the spelling book, his modes of thought were nevertheless strong, lucid, and accurate. And he yearned and pined for intellectual companionship beyond all ignorant men whom I have ever met. I believe that he would have talked all day and all night for days together to any officer who could instruct him until his companion, at least, fell asleep exhausted. His comprehension of the whole problem of slavery was more thorough and far-reaching than that of any abolitionist so far as its social and military aspects went. In that direction, I could teach him nothing, and he taught me much, but it was his methods of thought which always impressed me chiefly. Superficial brilliancy he left to others and grasped at the solid truth. Of course, his interest in the war and in the regiment was unbounded. He did not take to drill with especial readiness, but he was insatiable of it and grudged every moment of relaxation. Indeed, he never had any such moments. His mind was at work all the time, even when he was singing hymns, of which he had endless store. He was not, however, one of our leading religionists, but his moral code was solid and reliable, like his mental processes. Ignorant as he was, the years that bring the philosophic mind had yet been his, and most of my young officers seemed boys beside him. He was a Florida man and had been chiefly employed in lumbering and piloting on the St. Mary's River, which divides Florida from Georgia. Down this stream, he had escaped in a dugout and after thus finding the way, had returned, as had not a few of my men in other cases, to bring away wife and child. I wouldn't have left my child, Colonel, he said, with an emphasis that sounded the depths of his strong nature. And up this same river, he was always imploring to be allowed to guide an expedition. Many other men had rival propositions to urge, for they gained self-confidence from drill and guard duty, and were growing impatient of inaction. Ought to go to work, saw. Don't believe in we lying in camp, eating up the provisions. Such were the quaint complaints, which I heard with joy. Looking over my notebooks of that period, I find them filled with topographical memoranda, jotted down by a flickering candle from the evening talk of the men, notes of vulnerable points along the coast, charts of rivers, locations of pickets. I prize these conversations not more for what I thus learned of the country than for what I learned of the men. One could thus measure their various degrees of accuracy and their average military instinct, 
and I must say that in every respect, save the accurate estimate of distances, they stood the test well. But no project took my fancy so much, after all, as that of the delegate from the St. Mary's River. The best peg on which to hang an expedition in the Department of the South in those days was the promise of lumber. Dwelling in the very land of southern pine, the department authorities had to send north for it, at a vast expense. There was reported to be plenty in the enemy's country, but somehow the colored soldiers were the only ones who had been lucky enough to obtain any thus far, and the supply brought in by our men, after flooring the tents of the white regiments and our own, was running low. An expedition of white troops, four companies, with two steamers and two schooners, had lately returned empty-handed after a week's foraging, and now it was our turn. They said the mills were all burned, but should we go up the St. Mary's, Corporal Sutton was prepared to offer more lumber than we had transportation to carry. This made the crowning charm of his suggestion. But there is never any danger of erring on the side of secrecy in a military department, and I resolved to avoid all undue publicity for our plans by not finally deciding on any until we should get outside the bar. This was happily approved by my superior officers, Major General Hunter and Brigadier General Saxton, and I was accordingly permitted to take three steamers with 462 officers and men and two or three invited guests and go down the coast on my own responsibility. We were, in short, to win our spurs, and if, as among the Araucanians, our spurs were made of lumber, so much the better. The whole history of the Department of the South had been defined as a military picnic, and now we were to take our share of the entertainment. It seemed a pleasant share when, after the usual vexations and delays, we found ourselves, January 23, 1863, gliding down the full waters of Beaufort River, the three vessels having sailed at different hours, with orders to rendezvous at St. Simon's Island on the coast of Georgia. Until then, the flagship, so to speak, was to be the Ben de Ford, Captain Hallett, this being by far the largest vessel and carrying most of the men. Major Strong was in command upon the John Adams, an army gunboat carrying a 30-pound parrot gun, two 10-pound parrots, and an 8-inch howitzer. Captain Trowbridge, since promoted lieutenant colonel of the regiment, had charge of the famous planter, brought away from the rebels by Robert Small. She carried a 10-pound parrot gun and two howitzers. The John Adams was our main reliance. She was an old East Boston ferry boat, a double-ender, admirable for river work, but unfit for sea service. She drew seven feet of water. The planter drew only four, but the latter was very slow, and being obliged to go to St. Simon's by an inner passage would delay us from the beginning. She delayed us so much before the end that we virtually parted company, and her career was almost entirely separated from our own. From boyhood I have had a fancy for boats, and have seldom been without a share, usually more or less fractional, in a rather indeterminate number of punts and wherries. But when, for the first time, I found myself at sea as commodore of a fleet of armed steamers, for even the Ben de Ford boasted a six-pounder or so, it seemed rather an unexpected promotion, but it is a characteristic of army life that one adapts oneself as coolly as in a dream to the most novel responsibilities. One sits on court-martial, for instance, and decides on the life of a fellow creature without being asked any inconvenient questions as to previous knowledge of Blackstone, and after such an experience, shall one shrink from wrecking a steamer or two in the cause of the nation. So I placidly accepted my naval establishment, as if it were a new form of boat club, and looked over the charts, balancing between one river and another, as if deciding whether to pull up or down Lake Quinsigamond. 
If military life ever contemplated the exercise of the virtue of humility under any circumstances, this would perhaps have been a good opportunity to begin its practice. But as the regulations clearly contemplated nothing of the kind, and as I had never met with any precedent which looked in that direction, I had learned to check promptly all such weak proclivities. Captain Hallett proved the most frank and manly of sailors, and did everything for our comfort. He was soon warm in his praises of the demeanor of our men, which was very pleasant to hear, as this was the first time that colored soldiers in any number had been conveyed on board a transport, and I know of no place where a white volunteer appears to so much disadvantage. His mind craves occupation, his body is intensely uncomfortable, the daily emergency is not great enough to call out his heroic qualities, and he is apt to be surly, discontented, and impatient even of sanitary rules. The southern black soldier, on the other hand, is seldom seasick, at least such is my experience, and, if properly managed, is equally contented, whether idle or busy. He is, moreover, so docile that all needful rules are executed with cheerful acquiescence, and the quarters can therefore be kept clean and wholesome. Very forlorn faces were soon visibly among the officers in the cabin, but I rarely saw such among the men. Pleasant still seemed our enterprise as we anchored at early morning in the quiet waters of St. Simon's Sound and saw the light fall softly on the beach and the low bluffs, on the picturesque plantation houses which nestled there and the graceful naval vessels that lay at anchor before us. When we afterwards landed, the air had that peculiar Mediterranean translucency which southern islands wear and the plantation we visited had the loveliest tropical garden, though tangled and desolate, which I have ever seen in the South. The deserted house was embowered in great blossoming shrubs and filled with hyacinthine odors, among which predominated that of the little Chickasaw roses which everywhere bloomed and trailed around. There were fig trees and date palms, crepe myrtles and wax myrtles, Mexican agaves and English evies, japonicas, bananas, oranges, lemons, oleanders, jonquils, great cactuses, and wild Florida lilies. This was not the plantation which Mrs. Kemble has since made historic, although that was on the same island, and I could not waste much sentiment over it, for it had belonged to a northern renegade, Thomas Butler King. Yet I felt then, as I have felt a hundred times since, an emotion of heartsickness at this desecration of a homestead, and especially when, looking from a bare upper window of the empty house upon a range of broad, flat, sunny roofs, such as children love to play on, I thought how that place might have been loved by yet innocent hearts, and I mourned anew the sacrilege of war. I had visited the flagship Wabash ere we left Port Royal Harbor, and had obtained a very kind letter of introduction from Admiral Dupont, that stately and courtly potentate, elegant as one's ideal French marquis. And under these credentials, I received polite attention from the naval officers at St. Simon's Acting Volunteer Lieutenant Budd, of the gunboat Potomska, and Acting Master Moses, of the bark Fernandina. They made valuable suggestions regarding the different rivers along the coast and gave vivid descriptions of the last previous trip up the St. Mary's undertaken by Captain Stevens, USN, in the gunboat Ottawa, when he had to fight his way past batteries at every bluff in descending the narrow and rapid stream. I was warned that no resistance would be offered to the ascent, but only to our return, and was further cautioned against the mistake than common of underrating the courage of the rebels. It proved impossible to dislodge those fellows from the banks, my informant said. They had dug rifle pits and swarmed like hornets, and when fairly silenced in one direction, they were sure to open upon us from another. All this sounded alarming, but it was nine months since the event had happened, and although nothing had gone up the river meanwhile, I counted on less resistance now, and something must be risked anywhere.
we were delayed all that day in waiting for our consort and improved our time by verifying certain rumors about a quantity of new railroad iron which was said to be concealed in the abandoned rebel forts on St. Simons and Jekyll Islands, and which would have much value at Port Royal if we could only unearth it. Some of our men had worked upon these very batteries so that they could easily guide us, and by the additional discovery of a large flatboat, we were enabled to go to work in earnest upon the removal of the treasure. These iron bars, surmounted by a dozen feet of sand, formed an invulnerable roof for the magazines and bomb-proofs of the fort, and the men enjoyed demolishing them far more than they had relished their construction. Though the day was the 24th of January, 1863, the sun was very oppressive upon the sands but all were in the highest spirits and worked with the greatest zeal. The men seemed to regard these massive bars as their first trophies, and if the rails had been wreathed with roses, they could not have been got out in more holiday style. Nearly a hundred were obtained that day, besides a quantity of five-inch plank with which to barricade the very conspicuous pilot houses of the John Adams. Still another day we were delayed, and could still keep at this work, not neglecting some foraging on the island, from which horses, cattle, and agricultural implements were to be removed, and the few remaining colored families transferred to Fernandina. I had now become quite anxious about the missing steamboat, as the inner passage, by which alone she could arrive, was exposed at certain points to fire from rebel batteries, and it would have been unpleasant to begin with a disaster. I remember that, as I stood on deck in the still and misty evening, listening with strained senses for some sound of approach, I heard a low continuous noise from the distance, more wild and desolate than anything in my memory can parallel. It came from within the vast girdle of mist and seemed like the cry of a myriad of lost souls upon the hoary sun's verge. It was Dante become audible, and yet it was but the accumulated crees of innumerable seafall at the entrance of the outer bay. Late that night, the planter arrived. We left St. Simon's on the following morning, reached Fort Clinch by four o'clock, and there, transferring two hundred men to the very scanty quarters of the John Adams, allowed the larger transport to go into Fernandina, while the two other vessels were to ascend the St. Mary's River, unless, as proved inevitable in the end, the defects in the boiler of the planter should oblige her to remain behind. That night I proposed to make a sort of trial trip upstream, as far as Township Landing, some fifteen miles, there to pay our respects to Captain Clark's company of cavalry, whose camp was reported to lie nearby. This was included in Corporal Sutton's program, and seemed to me more inviting and far more useful to the men than any amount of mere foraging. The thing really desirable appeared to be to get them under fire as soon as possible, and to teach them, by a few small successes, the application of what they had learned in camp. I had ascertained that the camp of this company lay five miles from the landing, and was accessible by two roads, one of which was a lumber path, not commonly used, but which Corporal Sutton had helped to construct, and along which he could easily guide us. The plan was to go by night, surround the house and negro cabins at the landing, to prevent an alarm from being given, then to take the side path, and if all went well, to surprise the camp. But if they got notice of our approach, through their pickets, we should, at worst, have a fight, in which the best man must win. The moon was bright and the river swift, but easy of navigation thus far. Just below township, I landed a small advance force to surround the houses silently. With them went Corporal Sutton, and when, after rounding the point, I went on shore with a larger body of men, he met me with a silent chuckle of delight and with the information that there was a negro in a neighboring cabin who had just come from the rebel camp and could give the latest information. While he hunted up this valuable auxiliary, I mustered my detachment, winnowing out the men who had coughs, not a few, and sending them ignominiously on board again, a process I had regularly to perform during this first season of Qatar.
On all occasions where quiet was needed, the only exception tolerated at this time was in the case of one man who offered a solemn pledge that, if unable to restrain his cough, he would lie down on the ground, scrape a little hole, and cough into it unheard. The ingenuity of this proposition was irresistible, and the eager patient was allowed to pass muster. It was after midnight when we set off upon our excursion. I had about a hundred men marching by the flank with a small advanced guard and also a few flankers where the ground permitted. I put my Florida company at the head of the column and had by my side Captain Metcalf, an excellent officer, and Sergeant McIntyre, his first sergeant. We plunged presently into pine woods, whose resinous smell I can still remember. Corporal Sutton marched near me with his captured Negro guide, whose first fear and sullenness had yielded to the magic news of the President's proclamation, then just issued, of which Governor Andrew had sent me a large printed supply. We seldom found men who could read it, but they all seemed to feel more secure when they held it in their hands. We marched on through the woods, with no sound but the peeping of the frogs in a neighboring marsh, and the occasional yelping of a dog as we passed the hut of some cracker. This yelping always made Corporal Sutton uneasy. Dogs are the detective officers of slavery's police.